Hello, and welcome to another episode of Coach Better from Maduro Learning. My name is Clint Hamada. And my name is Kim Capino, and we'll be your hosts for today's episode. In this episode, we chat with Jess Kummerlin, Innovative Learning Coach at Sheko International School. Jess highlights the importance of empathy in building strong coaching relationships with members of the school community and shares some of his tips from his coaching toolkit to be visible, effective, and understood as a coach. If you enjoy any part of this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really does help us to know what you want to hear more about. Also subscribe to the channel to see all of our coaching videos and click on the notification bell so you know as soon as each video is posted. And please make sure to watch all the way to the end. We've got two great opportunities for your professional learning that we think you'll love. Let's get started. Welcome everyone. I'm here with Jess from Sheko International School. Um, Jess, if you can just take a minute and introduce yourself and let us know about your experiences both teaching and as a coach. Excellent. Um, my name is Jess Kummerlin. Uh, this is my second year here at Chico International School, and I am one of the I'm one of two learning innovation coaches. We have one for the primary school and one for the secondary school. Last year, I actually took the plunge and worked at the primary school for the first time in my career. I went down to the primary school, and then this year, I'm back up at secondary as the learning innovation coach here. And is this your first experience in a coaching role, or have you coached in previous positions in previous schools? Um, in my previous school, I was doing halftime working as the e-learning coordinator. So I was working with uh, teachers from grades K through 12 in terms of tech integration, but also taking a look at you know, innovative pedagogy, those types of things. So I was doing that for three years, and then here I'm strictly in the coach's role. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. So one of the things that we always hear when we speak with coaches is how important it is to build relationships and build rapport amongst your, your teachers. Um, what are some of the things that you do that you find really successful in helping you make those connections with colleagues on that professional level? You know, how do you put money into that kind of coaching bank that you can withdraw later when you really need to? Yeah, um, I think a big thing is to really understand what's going on in your school, or wherever, what division you're working on. And I think a big tool that's really helped me with that is TweetDeck. A lot of our teachers are on Twitter and they're, you know, tweeting about what's happening in their class, you know, things that they're finding. And using that, you get to see across the board, you know, many different hashtags, many different users, and just taking time every day to look at what's happening within your division. But then, uh, off of that, I call them the LIC walk. Essentially, the learning innovation coaches walk, essentially, is just being visible. I take an hour out of my time every day. I look at TweetDeck first, and I say, oh, yeah, these are the things that are happening. Let me stop by this room and say, hey, I saw you're doing this cool thing with um, this tool, or you're doing this new thing with your kids. You know, I'd love to learn more about that. And I think that goes though, a long way, because teachers are like, wow, I didn't know you saw that, or wow, yeah, let me tell you more about it. And it just instigates conversation automatically, which mm -hmm. then opens the doorway for you as a coach, which I think every coach struggles with, is getting that invitation to come in, discuss, you know, how you can extend the lesson, those different types of things. So that's been a tool that I've kind of cultivated in the last couple of years that works really well. Um, um, I was going to say, if I could just interrupt for a second, I think it's really great yeah. that you have teachers that are, putting that out there as well. I know you guys have a really active uh, school hashtag and they're just sharing kind of independently of you or of the coaches and it allows you to then have that insight and have that kind of big overview of the school, you know, kind of from, from TweetDeck. And then, like you said, you have that basis of conversation. Yeah, it's, uh, we're very fortunate at the school. You know, we've really deprivatized the learning process. It's just like, great, this is what's happening. You know, come share, listen, collaborate, all those different types of things. And it's really a marriage of, you know, the technology that exists today, but then also that human element. Sometimes we forget sometimes in this tech rich environment that, you know, that face to face is so important. And a big, a, you know, well, I think a big thing for me with the coach's role is to be super empathetic. You know, what are the needs of the teacher? not the needs of yourself sometimes because as a coach you're like oh i have all these great ideas but then if that doesn't fit in line with what the teacher is needing to enhance the learning of um, their students that becomes sometimes a 
a, a conflict where, you know, as a, as a coach, you don't want that. You want them to be inviting you in, not saying, oh, well, he's always trying to do this and that, and it doesn't fit with what we're doing. Right. I think that mindset to uh, what you just said, um, it's not about what you as the coach want to accomplish. It's about helping the teacher understand what it is that they're trying to accomplish or help them reach the goals that they have set um, and working within the parameters of their classroom or of their comfort level. And mm-hmm. part of that coaching is, is pushing them a little bit beyond that comfort level, but not throwing them you know, into the raging sea when they're not ready for it. No. I totally agree with everything you just said. And I think this goes into another question. I think question number two, but it's that idea of that, you know, as a coach, I think a lot of us can understand athletics and with athletics, we're always talking about the greatest investment a coach can be to, you know, a student is really acceleration from where they're at and where they want to get to. Right. Right. And I think the same is the same is true of us coaches and really providing that path for them to see it, even when they can't see it themselves. Right, because right, sometimes right. teachers are like, well, I, I'm not really good with tech, or I don't, I don't know how we could do this. But you have to reassure them and give them the belief that they can do it, even without them seeing all the steps. And then right. also that last part is, you know, when everything maybe falls apart and breaks, which is a part of innovation, you say that's normal, not like, hey, you're, that, that's on you, and, and you're a terrible teacher. You know, what happened? No, it's really like, okay, great. We tested that. That did not work. Okay, how can we learn from that and modify it so that it does work the next time? Right, so. right. And that iterative process. And I love the kind of that, that metaphor, that idea of acceleration and helping your, your teachers accelerate to reach their objectives rather than a linear, not always a linear path, right? Sometimes it has to be kind right. of a go slow to go fast. Um, and know yeah. that they, they have the support to, to go slow at first and that they will then eventually be able to go fast when they're ready, when they're ready. Yeah, um, exactly. So it's uh, what I know about Sheko and, and people who work there and now that you're there, um, you know, there is a, already a really strong culture of innovation and collaboration. Um, what do you see as really important to build a culture of coaching at a school, whether it's your current school or you're moving into a new school, um, you know, how do you start? What's kind of the mindset that, that maybe you bring to the role to help people understand um, why your position is important and how are you advocating for that role? Yeah, I think we're all in the business of improving humans. I mean, if we think about education, like we're here to help students, we're here to help parents, we're here to help, you know, teachers. We're in the business of helping human essentially and you know if we talk about human nature it's really about surround relationships and it doesn't matter if I'm in year one or year two or year three or if I'm moving to a new school it always starts with relationships because getting those deeper relationships opens up those conversations it opens up um, different profiles of teachers that you might have not known and then what's powerful off of that is then you can start empowering people that might have not done that or presented that in the past to do it in the future. So this power of relationships comes like full circle because then you're like, great, let me get to know you. Let me get to know what you're about, what you really want to do, what your biggest desires, what your biggest pains are. And then I can help you identify like what you can share with others. So then it becomes a culture of not just like funneling through one person, a coach, or a team leader, but it's like, oh yeah, that whole team is presenting now because you know those people that didn't present in the past now can, and then people see them in a different light and they're like, well, if they can do it, well, I can do it. Well, what can I share? And then it just becomes this domino effect. Right, right. And I, again, I like that, that mental image of the coach is using relationships almost as the, the lever, right? To, to, to start to empower those teachers. That's what's giving you that advantage is you have that really strong relationship and then building up like an army of of coaching, almost like coaching protégés who are like, oh, you know, Jess has helped me out. Um, You know, he did this, that, and the other thing. There's no reason why I can't go to somebody else in my department and offer that same level of assistance. They may not have the, the focused time to do it, but if you have those strong relationships, anybody can act as a coach to anybody yeah. in your, in your building or in your, uh, in your environment. Cool. Yeah, exactly. 
exactly. Um, yeah, I remember like when I first took this job at Jeff Utech, like uh, I was taking a course to Enduro. And I was like, you know, can you give me a suggestion of what the number one thing is? And he said, you know what? It's relationships. You might know all the tech in the world, but if you don't have the relationships, no one's, no one's going to work with you. Right. And that was five years ago. And I've still kept that in the forefront of me being in this role. It's like relationships have to come first. So true. So true. And you could say that about all of education, right? Yeah. I, I think back to my college professors and they're probably some of the most brilliant mathematical minds this world has ever seen. And they were horrible educators because they didn't build relationships with their students. They were so focused on the content or on the knowledge, not on the people who was, who were there to, to learn from them. Yeah. So, so true. Yeah. So, so true. true. <laughs> so, how do you stay motivated? Um, sometimes I think we all have that experience, maybe of feeling like, you know, you're working with a team or you're working with a grade level um, and you feel like you're maybe the only one who is super invested or who really cares about this, this innovative learning environment. What helps you stay motivated in a situation like that? I think for me, it's, um, I keep a focus on competing with myself, not with others. Because I think it's, it's a real thing today where, you know, Twitter, Facebook group, you just see so much out there. And then you can get inundated and say like, well, they're doing that and they're doing this. And then you start judging and comparing and then you start doubting what you're doing. So I really, in the last couple of years, really focused on, okay, my version of myself, you know, a week ago, am I doing a better job? Right. And that, and that's very, you have to be very reflective about this because you have to be honest and say, look, did I do what I was meant to do this week? Right. And if I didn't, what do I have to do next week in order to do that? Right. And if I can consistently do that from a week to week standpoint and say, look, last week I was here, but I wanted to get to this point and this week I need to do these actions. Then I feel that by taking care of just that, um, it's going to push me. Whereas if I get caught up in the sphere of, you know, Twitter or other things where I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all these amazing things people are doing or that school is doing this. So why aren't we doing it? It just, you become overwhelmed and you lose, you lose that empathy with your teachers because then you're like, oh, we should be doing this. And they're like, well, this doesn't fit with what we're doing. Right. And it goes back to that idea. Right. So, um, yeah, it's that idea of competing against yourself, not with others. I think that's right. huge. And you talked about kind of your own process of self-reflection. And I think as coaches, you know, we're often encouraging our teachers to kind of reflect on their practice and reflect on their objectives. And did they meet their objectives and could they do it differently? Or is there a way in which they could meet those objectives more effectively? Um, and oftentimes it's easy to forget about yourself, right? It's easy to who coaches the coach, um, who, yeah. who, who uses your sounding board to help you stay grounded and to help challenge you as well. And you, you know, you've mentioned social media and networks and, um, you know, there are lots of ways in which coaches can do that, but I think it is something really important that, that we do on our own time and, you know, and are reflective about it too, because we need to practice what we preach. And sometimes it's easy to get so caught up in teaching others or encouraging others that you forget to kind of tend to yourself. Yeah. So true. So true. <laughs> um, do you ever have that challenge of people kind of not understanding your role or what it is you do? And they just say like, wow, look at Jesse. He's, he doesn't have classes. He doesn't write reports. He's got all this free time or, you know, I, I, I think coaching obviously is a heck of a lot more than that, but sometimes that perception could be like, well, of course you can do it. You know, you have all of this time. Um, yeah. How do you deal with that challenge of being understood or misunderstood in the role of a coach? Um, I think it, the biggest thing for me is transparency. It's transparency, transparency, transparency. I make my calendars public. I don't keep them private. So everyone knows where I'm at. Um, all my conversations, uh, I, it's just, I just make it very transparent. So people know like, oh yeah, well he's here and he's there. And, and if you do look at my calendar, it's a much different story than if someone just saw me like walking around, like, oh, he's just walking around. But it's like, oh, he had a meeting here. He had a meeting here. He had a meeting here. Right. So that really helps when you make, you know, what your schedule transparent to others. Um, people are like, oh, wow. Okay. He is quite busy. So that's number one. I think 
I learned this also uh, in my master's program, but it's managed by walking around, being visible. You know, that's something in the, the beginning of my coaching career I didn't do a lot, and the per, you know the perception was that well, where is he? Right when you know as a coach you're like trying to research two hours for this problem that you know a teacher has that you're trying to fix or you're trying to figure out Arduinos for the first time, like all these things that take time, but that time you're like centered in an office, not out visible in front of other teachers. Right. Um, I think that was a big lesson for me because then, you know, I was doing all this work and the perception was like, well, where is he? Like, I don't see him a lot. When I was doing all this work, people just couldn't see it. So I just, at first I was like, got a little frustrated, but then I said, well, this is feedback. How can I use that to, you know, make myself better? So I thought, you know what, why not make myself available? one hour every day. I, I can carve out an hour a day where mm -hmm. I'm just walking around, building those relationships, finding out what's happening in classrooms. And um, it's been one of the most rewarding parts of this job because you learn so much more through three minute conversations with people in the hallway. And, you know, and it goes to the idea of perception. They're like, wow, I see him in that classroom. I see him in that classroom. So um, that really helps with the transparency bit too. And does that also help you make those bring those connections to your teachers as they're talking, you know, and you'd be like, Oh yeah, you're talking about this. I was in the math classroom and they were doing something similar. You know, how do we bring, bring you guys together so that you guys are working towards the same end and, and maybe helping them make those collaborative uh, units or lessons or whatever it happens to be. But you know, you, you are the, the connective tissue sometimes between the individual cells of the classrooms. No. Yeah, you are. Uh, as a coach, I think you, you have to be that in your position is to be that connector, like you say. And just for example, this past week, I was connected with a person down in our um, primary school where we were started an initiative last year. And then it was still in my mind and I brought it over here to primary and I was like, well, how can we do this? And then I talked with our director of social le uh, service learning and then I talked to a grade seven teacher and then I finally talked to a grade eight teacher that finally put the you know, missing pieces together for us to make this happen. But none of that would have happened if I hadn't, you know, actually pinged from the primary school to the service learning, to the grade seven, to the grade eight. You know, none of that would have been connected without it. And it wouldn't have happened if I didn't take these, you know, daily walks where I'm like, hey, I have this idea. So what do you think about this? So, oh, you should go talk to this person about it because right. they might be better for you. So, right. yeah, for sure. So you've kind of touched on on the the next question that I have is you know as a as a coach you wear many many different hats. Um, just thinking about your role, what would you say those hats are that you wear? I mean, you talked about the connector, right? Yeah. Um, you've talked about the researcher and learning how maybe Arduino's work to bring that into somebody's classes. Um, yeah. What are some of those other hats that you wear? And maybe some examples of how um, you've you've utilized that hat. Right. I think uh, definitely at our school, I'm just speaking from my experience here, you know, you know, what is the new cutting edge technology? I always have to be looking at that. Also looking at what are the new innovative practices? Also, you know, diving deep into curriculum, like the different age categories that you're working with. Uh, leadership, how can you be a leader? Model what you preach. Uh, emotional intelligence, EQ. I think that's huge. Every person that you deal with is different. So then how, to, how, how do you interact with them in a way where they feel that um, that time with you is meaningful, not just a one size fits all approach. Um, these are things that are just come, coming off the top of my head, but I think this is why every coaching job description that you find online is totally different. Right. Because there's so many different things that you do that, you know, and each school is gonna be slightly different. So. There's just so many. You can't name them all. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I know at, at, at ISB, where I am right now, our, our coaches spend a lot of time in the planning process, right? That's kind of like yep. laying the foundation. Um, you know, how do you guys work in that planning process? Is that something that you guys are in, like, dedicated meetings, or is it ad hoc, or are you called in as needed? What's your guys' model yep. in terms of that kind of co-planning hat that you might wear? Um, in the primary school, we're, we're running PYP. So that's just dedicated time where they are in the grade level meetings, mm -hmm. which is very powerful. 
And in terms of the secondary school, it's kind of a combination of dedicated time, but then also ad hoc, because sometimes people will have an idea outside of that meeting. So that's why I make my calendar available and I say, great, just book it if you have an idea. But it, there are dedicated times where I meet with curriculum team leaders of the different curriculums. And mm -hmm. then I sit and I listen and I say, you know, what are your biggest needs? Like, what do you guys want to really focus on? What do you want to enhance in terms of learning for your students? So it's a combination up here in secondary, so. What, you want to write that down. What do you want to focus on? Yeah. I think those are important questions to ask, right? Instead of coming in and assuming that you know what they want, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, like really listening, right? And then helping, yeah. helping to meet them where they are and then helping them to kind of take that next step. Um, yeah. A lot of schools these days are really focused on, you know, we need data, we need data-driven decision-making, we need all of this. Um, and I, I think people are starting to step back and realize that data is more than just a test score or more than just a number. Um, how do you use data in your role as a coach? What does data look like to you? Um, and maybe how, are you, how can you use that to help motivate teachers in getting them to think about their practice? I think a big thing is when you can, I think that role tangible as a coach. And um, it's like, for example, if, you, if we were to go into a seventh grade language, humanities class and they're working on a specific unit where the summative has been an essay, but the teacher says, look, I want to enhance the summative somehow. So a data point then can say, okay, great. Last year when you were doing it a certain way, this is where all your kids were at. This year, with this new innovative approach that we've come up together, you know, and we tested, what is the new data showing? Mm -hmm. That's tangible for people to see, because then it's really easy to say, oh, yeah, they were at a certain level here, and by using this new method, they are now here, so they can see that. And then as a teacher, they're like, oh, okay, great. Like, what's, what's the next thing we can tackle? Because sometimes we come in, and we can help, and we can do and build things, but they don't see the results of that. Because it right. could be just be for a formative. It could be just to make their class more efficient. Those different types of things. But when you can really go in and say, look, this is where we were before. And that could be even a pretest, mm -hmm. right? Not even the summative from the previous year. Like, this is where they were as a pretest. This is what happened after we worked together. And then that difference is really tangible for the teacher because it's like, oh, wow, like, I, I see the impact that that had. Uh, let's see how else we can just improve this process later on. Right, using, using your intervention, right? And what's the effect from yeah. point A to point B? Cool. Um, so what, what do you think you do to make yourself invaluable as a coach? Like what are the things that your teachers, if we were to, to go down and speak to the, the teachers at SRS, and they'd be like, oh, I love that Jess does this, or I love how he you know, focuses on that. What, what are the things that you think make you particularly, and maybe coaches in general, invaluable to their, to their teachers and to their school communities? Yeah, I think for this question, I have two answers. The first is empowering others. I think that's what a coach does, right? He doesn't highlight himself. He empowers the people around him. And that's the big thing I really focus on is, you know, what are the superpowers, I call them superpowers, that people have? And how can we highlight that? How can we get them out in front of other people um, so that they can share that and increase the level, up level our school, up level our division, up level their, um, their uh, you know, the curriculum team that they're involved with, right? It's how can we do that in a way that they feel comfortable with, not just like, hey, I, you do that really well, you should go tell people about it. But right. really coaching them up and say, look, this is powerful. This can impact other grades. This can impact language. It'd be great if you can stand up and I can help you create a slide deck or I can help you do this, but just getting people out there to do it, you know? And I think that's such a big part of our job. You know, yes, we want to be innovative. Yes, we want to be on the forefront of technology, but also it's that empowering others to, you know, show what they, that they can do, right? Because then that's just going to raise the bar with everyone else around them. That's, yeah, yeah, that's number one. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, I think sometimes the way a, a coach can measure their success is by the success of others. Yeah. Right. And when you're looking at your, your cohort that you're working with, when they are successful, you are successful. Right. And that, that's helping others to see, 
you know, not that you have done it, but you have helped them to do that or you have helped them to, to find that, that courage or to find that confidence to be able to step up and present at a faculty meeting or present at a conference or to try something new. And I think that's, that's so true. Um, and I do think that teachers really appreciate that, seeing their colleagues stand up and make that step and feeling accomplished once they've stood up and made that step as well. Well, yeah. number two. So true. Number two is, uh, I call it the macro-micro balance. I think as a coach, you really need to be able to zoom out to the 30,000 foot view and say like, okay, great, how's everything connected? But then zoom back down to 3,000 feet because then you have to be like, all right, I can see how it's all connected, but like we need to get down to the nuts and bolts and see how this all works. And I think a lot of uh, what I like to do is, I really like to do that with teachers or teams that I'm working with. It's like, great, let's look at the big picture. Like how does this all fit into what you want to do? But then how do we do that today? And how do we do that tomorrow so that we do meet that target? Um, because it is very easy sometimes to get caught in a 3,000 foot view. It's like, all right, we have to fix that. We have to put out that fire and we have to do this. And you don't take that time to zoom out and say, yeah, we're doing all this. Why? How is it all connected? And if you lose focus of that, that's where like burnout comes from. That's where overwhelm comes from because you're doing all this activity and you don't know where it's leading to. And I think that's so important for you to remind teachers, like, I know this is tough, but like this is super powerful for your kids. And this is how it's going to impact them. And this is how it's going to you know, help your curriculum team. And, you know, once they take a moment to think about that, they're like, okay, I'm refreshed. I can do this. So that really that macro micro balance. I think the big picture is, is easily lost. And you in that role of connector or you in that role of being able to go at different grade levels or in different classrooms and help them see this is where it's going to end up, or this is what you're preparing them for, or, you know, it, it does give that perspective that is sometimes when it's not specifically related to my content or to my classroom that you sometimes miss. So, so, yeah. so useful. So yeah. we've been talking about the positives. Um, mm -hmm. What about the negatives? Like where is it that coaches sometimes fail? Where is it that coaches sometimes struggle? And, and what can, what suggestion or advice can you give to coaches for, them to do about it? You know, what can they do to, to help pull themselves out of that, those negative moments? Yeah, I think coaching um, at times can be a thankless job. Um, I don't know how to rephrase that in a way, but really there's times when you do a lot of work when no one recognizes it. And sometimes you're like, man, I just spent like two days doing that and I didn't get a thank you. <laughs> I didn't get anything, no recognition. and in the very beginning, that, that frustrated me because I was like, I don't think people appreciate what I did. And that was the wrong viewpoint of it for me. And it, trans, it transformed because then if you, from that mindset, at that point, you're not going to be empathetic at all. Right. If you think about it. And you're just going to be like, well, I did this last time, and, uh, but nothing happened or I wasn't recognized. So then what am I going to do next? Well, I'm not going to be empathetic. So it took me very quickly to understand that, get me out of that space, is that, you know, a big part of my job is to empower people. And to empower people, I have to be empathetic, right? And if I'm going to be empathetic, I can't work from that space. And, and I understand now, you know, being a coach for five years that, you know, yeah, that, that's, this is a part of the job is our role is to be in a lot of different places doing a lot of different things and sometimes people are not going to see because they're busy right. they're honestly busy right and because of that um i think that's an easy trap to fall into right in the beginning when you're coaching because you're like man i did all that but it's really like you did all that great that's making that department better right or that's making that group of teachers better or that's helping that group of students what's the next thing that you can do and the more empathetic you can be, the more gratitude that you can show, um, I think it just elevates your game as a coach versus being stuck in that idea of like not being recognized, even though you did all that work, you know, it's going to keep you in a place that's not going to up-level your game at all. Right. Letting the work speak for itself and maybe more for the intrinsic motivation of knowing what you're bringing to the organization. And I love how you keep bringing it back to this idea of empathy. And how again, that idea of relationships and how it's, it's helping to understand 
where your teachers are coming from. I think a lot of times as a coach, it's easy for me to forget that I have sometimes the luxury of time to think about yeah. these things and to dig deeper and to do some research and to really kind of, you know, reach out and find other ways to do that. Classroom teaching, you don't always have that time. You don't have that luxury. Um, and so part of my role when I was more actively coaching was being that person, right? And, and doing that, that legwork and they, you're right. They don't always say thank you. Um, but you yeah. can't step back and say, we, I, I'm confident that this experience was better for the students. And I'm confident that the teacher that I've worked with has made some improvements or has made some changes into their own thinking. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to sometimes for that to be enough, but that, that is enough. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, and it's powerful once you make that shift. And um, yeah, I still remember that. that. That was an experience where, you know, in the very beginning of my coaching career, that happened. And then I was just like, man, I'm operating from a wrong space for this. Right. And then I recognized that. And then you're just like, it's powerful once you're just like, oh, great. Like, yeah, like, let me help you solve that. Right. And so, yeah. So you were saying that this is your second year starting at, at SIS. Last year was your yep. first year. Um, what were some tips that you would suggest or some things that you learned coming into a, a school as a, in a role, in a new coaching role, a new coach in a school with an established coaching program or culture? What, what um, are some tips that you would give to any aspiring coaches or any coaches who are in transition to think about as they move into those new schools? Um, I think I have two, actually. I have suggestions for a person that wants to become a coach. Mm -hmm. First of all is don't wait. I think I, I, I talk to a lot of people sometimes and they're like, well, I got to wait for an opportunity or this and that is, you know, you probably have something that you can share. You probably have something that can help student learners. You can have something that can help teachers. Like don't wait for an invitation, go out there, you know, ask how you can get in front of an audience to help those people. Right. Because oftentimes I think a lot of people do have things to share, but they're waiting for someone to come tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, can you do this thing for us? Because it's awesome. When you, you, they don't have to wait for that invitation. Right. You know, and by doing that, and by doing that, being proactive doing that, then it really facilitates being a coach sooner rather than, you know what, hey, I want to be a coach, but I'm going to wait till I'm a coach to do this. Right, That's right. That's yeah. such good advice. Um, for the... A coach transitioning, I would say to come in and learn why things are done the way they are. That's the number one thing I think is so important coming into a new place because we can all come in guns blazing like this worked at my last school and it's going to work at this school and you know it's, it's got to work and you come in and try to change stuff up and people will just paint this target on you like who is this guy right? right? So I think it goes back to relationships. Like get to know the people, get to know, you know, you know, what they're about, you know, what they're trying to accomplish in their classrooms, you know, what their biggest pain points are, like what are they struggling with? But then also like why are decisions made that way? Or why is that system built like that? Really understand why, because then if you are gonna make a change, you could say, Well, yeah, this is why we've made this decision, but this, these are the problems or obstacles that come with that. And this new way possibly alleviates that versus coming in and say, hey, here's this new way. We should try it. Right, right. And I think that also helps you understand the history of how they got to that point because it could be what you're suggesting has already been tried in a different fashion. <laughs> like it's yeah. new to you, but it's not new to them. And I think asking why and understanding that history, you know, is so important. And we, you can't come in with the answers. And again, back to the yep. idea of empathy, if you're understanding the empathy of, of the organization or of the group, right? Empathizing with those people and understanding the pain that they are feeling. These are questions that come up naturally and you get a good, a good understanding of where they have been and where they want to go before you make that, that jump. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Last question for you. What yeah. is the one resource? You only got one, one resource Ooh. that you recommend to others about improving your practice as a coach? What's been in impactful in your own uh, philosophy about being a coach? What's helped you with ideas or with mindset or anything? 
Um, oof. I, I wrote down an answer for this, but I think I'm going to change it on the whim here. But I think the biggest resource is that I invested into my personal development. Um, because once you get better, everything else gets better. And um, I've taken the time, I've, uh, I've uh, invested the resources to really become better as you know, a person health wise, relationship wise, and that's shown up in my coaching, I think tenfold. Where as I think in the past we get a bit like, hey, I'm gonna invest in that course, I'm gonna do that. But if you're not healthy, if you're not in a good space, then really that other stuff doesn't matter. But when I made that decision to be like, you know what, I, I'm gonna up level myself and because I up level myself, then everything else around me starts up level. Right. So I would say that that has been the biggest resource for me is really investing into my growth as an individual. And then because of that, that growth has been just tapped into everything else I've done as a coach. And so that's what I would say is the greatest resource. And you're looking bigger than your professional development. You're talking about, you know, you're talking about health and you're talking about relationships and you're talking about yeah. kind of, again, you, you call it personal development and I, I was writing my own yeah. notes and I put personal professional development. I'm like, no, no, he's not talking about, yeah. I went to that conference to, to yeah. learn about coaching is I, I invested in this so that I am a, a better individual. Yeah. You know, it, it's so powerful because I think as driven coaches, you know, anyone listens to this podcast, we're already doing great and amazing things, but you know, what drives all of that? Well, it's how you feel as a person. It's, you know, how you feel physically and all these different types of things. And, you know, in the past I would be one of those grinders that would just figure stuff out. And even if I didn't feel good physically, I would just do it. But then, you know, it was insane. Once I started taking care of my body, once I started taking care of my relationships outside of work, that work actually improved on its own. Right. right. When, you know, in the past I was just like, you know, I'll take that one more course and I'll learn that one more thing. And, I'll, I'll go to two more conferences and that will make it all happen when it, yeah, that helps. But in the end, if you don't feel good and if you're not in a good space, then none of that else, no, nothing else really matters. <laughs> nothing else really matters. Well, listen, thank you, Jess. I really appreciate the time that you, uh, you took with us today and sharing your insights and your thoughts. And um, it sounds like amazing things are happening at SIS and I look forward to hearing more. All right. Thanks, cool. Clint. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you so much for watching our video today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and click the notification bell so you'll know when we release a new video each week. At Aduro Learning, as you know, we want to help you coach better. To get you started, we've got a free digital download for you called Five Strategies for Your Coaching Toolkit right in the description box below. And if you're looking for even more, we now offer private coaching sessions to help you work through any specific issue you might be having as a coach or even just as an educator. Do you have a problem you can't seem to solve? Get your introductory private coaching session for free with us. Learn more at adorolearning.com slash private coaching. Thanks for joining us today and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.